Hello, and thank you very much for coming here today at this talk about digital identity and where we will discuss on how to implement digital identity depending on the data that you try to store, that you are storing in your applications. When we are talking about digital identity, we refer to a unique representation of a user who engages in an online transaction. This must take into account both the authentication, the digital authentication, and session management. Okay. Better? To prove that someone is who they claim to be and to do this remotely via digital services and then to preserve this state for the entire period of the transaction is full of opportunities for attackers to impersonate someone's digital identity. In fact, even large companies get it wrong. Like for example, Deloitte data breach last year where the hackers got access to the global email service through an admin account. Okay, it is true that the admin account was protected only via uh, using a password, so there was no, not in place a second factor. Uh, but once the hackers got access to the global mail, they not only got access to the customer's emails, but they also got access to username, passwords, architectural diagrams for businesses, health information. So we are talking about quite critical, highly sensitive type of data. But who am I and why am I talking to you today about digital identity? My name is Katie Anton and I come from a software development background, just like yourself, where I have led and created teams of developers. And at one point I had to start looking into securing the software of the company where I was working on at the time. I currently work as application security consultant at Veracode, a business unit within CA Technologies. And Veracode realized that it's better to train developers into application security than infosec people in software development. So the majority of us are there have a development background. I'm also a chapter leader for OASP Bristol in England, where we uh, gather for um, meetings on various topics about security. And I'm also one of the project leaders on OASP Top 10 Proactive Controls. This is a project for developers with um, a, a list of 10 controls that every developer should use in their software project. The digital identity is one of the uh, controls as part of the latest version of the project which was recently released. This presentation is an expanded version of that, pro uh, of that control. So in the project you are going to have only one page, uh, not even close to what I'm going to talk today. So when we talk about digital identity, we refer to a unique representation of a user who engages in an online transaction to access a digital service. It may or may not track to a real specific person. <coughs> to ensure that a user can access a digital service, it needs to prove that the user is who they claim to be. The digital authentication is the process of verifying that a subject is in the possession of one or more valid authenticators. Once the user has successfully authenticated, we want to preserve that authenticated state throughout the entire period of the transaction to not request the user to re-authenticate on every single request. And decision management is the process of maintaining the user's authenticated state throughout the entire per period. So these are the three main concepts that we are going to focus on as part of this presentation and expand. But first, let's talk about the security levels. Now, in security, we try to calibrate everything around the value of the assets we try to protect. So the, highly, the, the higher the value of the asset, the higher the security must be in place in order to accordingly protect that asset and efficiently protect it. Evidently, the smaller the value, 
less security controls you need to put in place. After all, you don't put a $5 million firewall if your data is public. So it must be a good correlation between the value of the asset and the security level in order to effectively protect that asset. In the case of digital identity, the asset is the personal identifiable information. Uh, this is any type of information that can by itself or in conjunction with any other type of data can trace back to a real life person. So this is the asset that we are going to focus as part of the digital identity and we are going to explore a little bit more. So when it comes to personal identifiable information, there are three security levels that we can talk about. The first, security level one, is for applications that contain no personal identifiable information or any other type of information that can trace back to a real life person. So in this type of applications, there is no link to uh, connect to a real life specific person. It can be anything from Donald Duck to Donald Trump, not that they are the same. The authentication in this case requires just some confidence that the claimant is bound to the subscriber account. Second, the security level two is for those applications that contain uh, self-declared personal identifiable information or any other type of online data. This can be anything from email addresses, postal email, a picture, any evidence that can trace back to a real life specific person. The authentication assurance for this type of application should provide a high confidence that the subject is bound, uh, that the claimant is bound to the subscriber's account. And level three is for those type of applications that have highly critical sensitive data, data that can lead to financial losses, personal harm. Those type of applications uh, must have in place an authentication that can provide a very high confidence that the claimant is bound to the subscriber's account. Great, so let's go a little bit more in detail in each of these security levels. So the first security level is for applications that contain no personal identifiable information or any other type of private data. So this type of applications must provide, um, the authentication must provide some confidence that a claimant is bound to the subscriber account. This can be done through a single factor authentication, uh, which is usually done through the password. And when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking of what should I put, uh, what should I discuss as part of the passwords? Um, should I also talk about plain text passwords? Um, but it turns out that there are still many companies out there that store the password in plain text, unfortunately. Like for example, the T-Mobile Austria, this was recently on Twitter, um, where it turns out that they actually store the passwords in plain text because Oh, they want to help you out. So the customer service agents can see the first four letters because you might forget the password. And they want to help you out to remember your password. Um, of course, after quite a little bit of debacle on Twitter and peer pressure, they said that they are going to change this one. Um, but this is just an example and there are more many out there. Another thing is which characters should be part of a password. And this is an example from KLM. Anyone working for KLM? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Where they have a very small selection of uh, symbols. Uh, the interesting fact, and that's why they got a uh, place on my slides, is that they don't allow single code. So you can't register on KLM if you try to enter single code. Now, you have to remember that single code is a meta character for SQL injection. So why then don't they don't allow characters like meta characters 
for SQL injection into their password. I'll let your imagination wild on that one. So that's another one. Which characters should be part of the password? And this is another area where there is quite a little bit of misunderstanding. And another thing is that today more and more of us have lots of accounts, lots of passwords with those accounts, and more people have started using password managers. So it is important to allow in your application to have the paste functionality, unless of course you are a British guest, which they don't allow it on the password change for, uh, because they want you to ensure that you have typed in the right password. So you can't copy and paste, because you must type it to ensure that you type the right password. So this is just uh, a, a small selection of various cases from out there on the internet uh, because there is quite a little bit of misunderstanding of which should be the characters in the passwords and how they should be stored. And probably the misunderstanding comes because there isn't quite a good understanding of what the password is and what's the, uh, the best way to protect those. So, When it comes to the passwords, the whole, the entire purpose of protecting the password is to make it as difficult as possible for the attackers when the database is leaked. You might not even know that the database is leaked, but it might already be. In fact, there are two types of organizations, those that have been hacked and those that don't know it yet. So this is one, this is the main purpose of having in place good uh, control, security controls, to make it as difficult as possible for the attackers when the database is leaked. Once the database is leaked, what they are going to, to do is they will try to crack those passwords and to get to understand of what was your initial password that was, uh, uh, that led to uh, the format that is stored in the database. And when cracking the passwords, when we are talking about cracking the passwords, this is the equivalent of breaking the front door of a house in order to break into the house. So you can do this one by <coughs> brute force attacks. This means that you can try that password uh, against a list of words or a rainbow table attacks, which is uh, check the hash of the password against the pre-computed uh, hashes. So these are the main two methods of password cracking, brute force and rainbow table attacks. So all the security controls that we need to put in place, we have, they have to be resilient to this, this type of attacks. So as a result, when we are talking about uh, the best practices for implementing passwords, well, when it comes to the characters, we should not limit the characters of the passwords. Um, According to the latest guidelines from NIST, anyone have heard about NIST? So NIST stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology in America. They actually allow, uh, recommend to allow users to enter any passwords, including space, including emojis. If your users want to have in password emojis, let them have emojis. So any type of characters, as to characters. Uh, with the increase of the password managers, it is important to allow in our applications the paste functionality. Next, the passwords entered by the users should be ideally checked against a list of bad passwords. Now you can come up with a list of bad passwords from the, pa the, the most common passwords that have been found in previous data breaches. And there are already lists out there that give you this. So you can just select the top most passwords found in data breaches, and that can be part of your uh, list of bad passwords. To that, you can actually add um, uh, dictionary words or character, repetitive character or sequential words like AAA or one, two, three, ABC, sequential. Now, when it comes to the length, 
the minimum recommended length is eight characters. And we should also help the users to choose a strong password by um, having in place password strength meters. And we shouldn't uh, force the users to a certain length. We should allow the users to enter passwords as lengthy as they want, uh, of course, within reason. If the password is too long, then there is a risk of uh, denial of service. And uh, some algorithms, like BigCrypt, uh, truncates over 72 bytes, to 72 bytes. To avoid this type of problems, one way is to implement a modern hash, like SHA-512, which is for 64-bit uh, architecture. So this helps you to deal with the denial of service and truncation. Now, when it comes to the algorithms, the, you, you must have in place a strong cryptographic algorithms, and these are uh, key derivation uh, function algorithms. So if you have been to yesterday's uh, talk about cryptography, it touched there a little bit. So the difference between this and a hash is that uh, they are iterated, then the process is iterated, and that's where you have the work factor. Um, in the case of PHP, you shouldn't do much. The only thing that you must, you can do is to use the password hash because it already uses uh, bcrypt script and the from version 7.2 also has the, the, ne the, the latest password standard, which is the Argon 2. So a strong cryptographic algorithm should be. Anyone here that doesn't use the password hash or the compatible library? Okay, good. So everybody uses it. Okay, and the next thing is the credential, the salt. Uh, which has to be uh, unique per user and random. It, has, it must have a high entropy. And again, one of the changes that have been done in uh, PHP is that uh, the salt has been eliminated from the password hash from version seven, which is an awesome thing because under the hood, uh, the salt uses uh, as uh, sources of entropy in the Linux, the uh, dev, you random, which are some of the best uh, sources of entropy anyway. So wherever you would have come would not have been even close to that one. So the only thing that you need to do in PHP is use the password hash you, uh, without uh, defining your own salt, use the uh, algorithms, the methods default salt. But, so if we are to recap is that as part of the uh, best practices for the passwords, don't limit the characters, allow the users to enter uh, any characters they want, uh, to protect against denial of service and truncation, use a modern hash like SHA-512, uh, have a user specific salt and uh, strong cryptographic algorithms in place which is good because most people will do this one, but in application security, an important thing is to be consistent and do it consistently throughout the application. And this is an example from Ashley Madison website. Uh, you might have heard of Ashley Madison. Uh, their website was PHP, and they had a pretty good algorithm to store the password, which was Bcrypt. The problem is that the same password that the users would enter was also used for a fast login key. And that was hashed with the deprecated MD5. As soon as this was understood, it was very easy to crack the passwords. Around 11 million passwords were cracked because of this flaw into their software. So that is probably the difficult part because for us as defenders, because as an attacker, they need, a hacker needs only one flow into the system to bring it down. As developers, we have to defend everything. So it's important to apply, cons one security control, apply consistently throughout the application in order to have a secure application. <coughs> Moving on, uh, at security level two, 
this is for self-declared personal identifiable information or any other type of information that can lead can trace back to a certain user. Uh, for this level, the authentication must assurance must provide a high confidence that the claimant is bound to the subscriber's account. And this needs to be done through the pos uh, possession of two valid authenticators uh, or multi-factor authentication. If we are to recap, the multi-factor authentication ensures that uh, the users are who they claim to be by the, by the verification of any of the something they know, like a PIN or a password, something they own, like a phone or a token, and something they are, biometrics. <coughs> when it comes to biometrics, it's worth mentioning that biometrics by itself is a valid factor, but is not a valid authenticator. So you must use biometrics in combination with any of the above. Also, it's worth mentioning that SMS is not considered uh, a good second uh, mechanism for sending the second factor authentication uh, due to weaknesses in signaling system seven. <coughs> uh, this system, the signaling system seven, is a very old technology, initially designed for fixed phones around 70s. Some of you might not have been born that time. <coughs> and the weak point of the system is that it is based on trust. So if a call is made from phone A to phone B, the phone B assumes the call comes from phone A. And you might think that, oh yeah, but that's not going to happen, right? But like I said at the beginning, it all depends of the value of the assets the hackers are after. And there have been cases like in Germany last year where German banks in particular, the ones that have been, that had, were using mobile transaction authentication number were targeted. And the attack uh, consisted of two parts. The first part were spamming uh, and sending the users to fake websites where the hackers uh, collected their account numbers, names, uh, uh, passwords, phone numbers. After that one, the second part of the attack was uh, to uh, break into the mobile uh, networks and then intercept the call and forwarding the calls to the attacker's phone. As a result, uh, the attackers were able to initiate money transfer, intercept the call that, uh, received, that contained the mobile transaction authentication number, forward the call to their own phones, and then transfer the money. So it all depends on the value of the assets it is and the effort it requires. Great, so this is one of the reasons why NIST prepares to ban the uh, SMS-based second factor authentications. Instead, you should use a FIDO or a dedicated app. And level three is for those applications that contain highly sensitive critical data, data that can lead to financial losses, personal harm, uh, civil or criminal violations. Those type of applications, the authentication for those type of applications must provide a very high confidence that the claimant is bound to the subscriber's account. And to do this, uh, you need to be in the position of the cryptographic key, or, or, in, or in other words, to be in the position of the hardware-based cryptographic authenticator. In other words, you can have an RSA token, for example. But if there is an RSA token involved, it's important to understand that, that the token is still a secret. So you shouldn't have it, uh, have a webcam pointing at it uh, publicly with a publicly facing webcam like this guy, which he said that um, 
found it too difficult to carry it around and he was afraid of losing it. So the best idea he came up with is to have a publicly facing webcam to the RSC token. Yeah, just carry it around. You might lose it, that's fine, you can have another one. Um, but yeah, don't have a publicly facing webcam. It is a secret. So if we are to recap the, the security levels that we have discussed by now and the authentic appropriate authentication level for those, for level one, security level one, which contains no personal identifiable information or any other type of information that can trace back to a real person, the application, uh, the authentication for the application must provide some confidence that the subject is bound to the subscriber's account. And this can be done using a one fa a single factor authentication, usually through the use of a password. Now, For applications level two that contains self-declared personal information or any other type of online data that can lead to trace back to a real life person, the authentication assurance must provide a high confidence that the subject is claimed to the subscriber's account and this can be done using the two-factor authentication. And for applications that contain highly sensitive data uh, the authentication must provide a very high confidence that the claimant is bound to the subscriber's account and this must be done through a two-factor authentication with a hardware-based token. So let's go now through some examples. So I'll go first through a generic job website. And in the case of a job we a website, the uh, data that is there stored by that application is usually self-declared personal identifiable information. So for that type of application, a single factor authentication is not going to be good enough. Uh, that is a level two application and the appropriate authentication assurance must be done using a two factor authentication. Let's go back to the Deloitte data breach that we have discussed at the beginning of this presentation. So that was a breach from an admin account to their global email server, which apart from the customer's emails, they also have username, passwords, architectural diagrams for businesses, so highly critical information. This, may, uh, this information, this data, put that application on level three. They had in place a single factor authentication, not near good enough. What they should have had in place was a two-factor authentication with a hardware-based token. I know, it's admin account. How many of you still have applications with admin admin? Not many, okay. So until now we have discussed about the authentication. Um, but once the user has successfully authenticated, we want to preserve that uh, the user's authenticated state throughout the entire period of the transaction and for this uh, we use the session management. So the session management is, we use it for tracking a user's authenticated state and for traditional web-based session management systems, this can consists of two parts, the server-side part where we store the data and we obtain a session identifier and the client-side part where uh, that contains the session identifier. So when it comes on the server side, some best practices will uh, need to take into account that the session ID uh, generated should be long, unique, and random. This means that it must have a high entropy. So you uh, don't, uh, in order to avoid any chance of ending up with two identical session identifiers for different user data. Um, in production environment, especially in busy production environments, it, there is a chance of this happening if depending of the, especially on caching, depending of which caching you have. So if the caching mechanism doesn't have enough, en high en enough entropy when generating the uh, session data, then you can end up with two sessions, same identifier, but different user data. It happened to me, it was very difficult to trace that back. 
So it is possible in highly busy production environments. So just be careful of your uh, algorithm that generates the session identifier. <coughs> then uh, another thing is that when a user authenticates and re-authenticates, we need to generate a new session. Uh, this avoids session fixation flaws. And another thing is that ideally we should have in place a timeout after uh, a certain period of inactivity and an absolute maximum lifetime. <coughs> this, the timeout, the value for the timeout and the absolute uh, maximum lifetime should be in corre correlation with the value of the data you try to protect. So the higher the value, the less the value for the timeout and uh, the absolute uh, lifetime. This means that if you have highly uh, valued data in your application, you should ask your users to re-authenticate more often than if the value of the data is not that high or if it is public data. Okay, so until now we have discussed about the session management on the server side. When it comes to the client side, browser cookies are the one that actually uh, are used as a mechanism of transfer for session identifier. Uh, when it comes to the browser cookies, when used as a mechanism to, for transferring the session identifier, few defenses that you should consider are to have the minimum domains, set of domains and paths, to have for those cookies uh, set to expire at or after the uh, session identifier has expired, uh, the secure flag helps you to uh, ensure that the cookies can be transferred only via secure channel, in other words, uh, HTTPS. And also the same site uh, equals strict ensures that your cookies are, cannot be transferred if there are cross-site requests. This helps to protect against cross-site request forgery. So if we are to sum up, and what I would like you to take away after this presentation is, when you implement, uh, so what I would like you to uh, take away is when you go back to your applications to try to identify what is the type of data that you store in your application, and based on that data, to identify the appropriate security level. After that, identify what's the appropriate authentication for that security level. And also we have to have in place a good session management to um, prevent any cases uh, of digital identity impersonation. And on this note, thank you very much. <laughs>